Thanks, Jim. Jim asked me to come give a talk at this conference to give a, an independent industry perspective on the significance of universal serial bus and where I see it going. Uh, I welcome this opportunity because I think, as obviously a lot of you agree, universal serial bus is going to be a uh, really revamp PC's I.O. and is finally going to solve a lot of problems that have been lingering over a period of time. The PC has a lot of historical baggage. Right? It's now almost a 15-year-old platform. And if you think back to 1981 when the PC came out, things like modems and mice were pretty exotic. Um, there were relatively few peripherals available. Interface speeds were low. 1,200 baud seemed fast. Uh, and as the PC evolved incrementally, one interface after another got added for each device. High-speed serial interfaces are now eminently practical. It's not an exotic technology to provide a 10 or 15 megabit per second serial interface. And it's not a big problem to have 10,000 gates of logic as part of that interface. As, as you know, semiconductor density has increased dramatically, it becomes practical to associate a lot more intelligence with each one of those nodes. So the technology um, allows us to really change the kind of interface. And having a shared interface really makes, I mean, the new technology and the shared interface makes everything better. The cost is going to go down. The user complexity goes way down. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a case where the, the, the technology, things that what was possible from the technology was so far out of step with what was being built that there's just enormous gains made possible by making this transition. So into this need entered Serial Bus. Uh, it has been designed, you know, not with PCs of, of 15 years ago, but designed for today's PCs and with a view forward towards what PCs are going to be doing in the next uh, five, maybe to 10 years. I don't know that anybody can really see out 10 years very accurately, but, but clearly there's a bunch of headroom here. It's, it's not out of gas uh, in, early in its life. Um, it's optimized for high integration implementations. It assumes that you're going to be integrating this function into a chipset or maybe into one peripheral chip as part of a chipset and that you're going to integrate the peripheral end of it into a microcontroller that's, that's going to be there anyway to control the peripheral. The bus is inexpensive to implement. You'll hear a lot more about all these details through the conference. I won't belabor the details here, but the fact that it is just, just four pins, uses regular CMOS levels, has a low speed mode for low speed devices, these are you know, important design factors and that the design point of this was really low cost. And I think you know, the, the thing that makes USB different than the other serial buses, and I'll talk in a minute about some of the alternatives, is that it really was, it, it was a design focus on low cost, and on providing this whole range of needs. The key point here is you're going to be able to connect as many devices as you want. You're not going to be limited by the number of serial ports or the number of interrupts available for your add-in card or the number of slots. It's, it's an essentially infinite connection within the context of its intended application. Power is supplied to the devices. You know, actually, thanks to the ingenuity of people who design peripherals, people actually figured out how to suck power out of a serial port. Um, and so we have mice that connects to serial ports and pull their power out of a serial port, but serial ports were never intended to supply power. So there is some cost associated with sucking power out of them. You can only get so much. Uh, this is really designed to supply power, and it can deliver power to quite a number of devices. And it's also designed to support asynchronous devices, but also the isochronous support that you need for um, real-time information like audio and video. And as I mentioned, there is a low speed mode. You know, one of the real quandaries when you're divide, designing an interface like this is just where do you set the clock rate, the bit rate? Do you want to set it at the highest speed that you think is implementable at a reasonable cost so that you have the most headroom for future applications? Or do you want to set it at the lowest speed that the applications you have in mind today can get by with so that you minimize your cost? And the clever solution they came up with was to do both. That is, there, there is both a relatively high speed mode and a relatively low speed mode. And the device by device, they can choose. And a device that chooses to run in the low speed mode carries none of the burden of a high speed device. It doesn't have to have the shielding. It doesn't have to twist, have twisted pairs. Um, it can use less expensive process technology. Um, and this, again, I think is a good example of there being a real focus on the realities of the marketplace, the design points you have to be at for this to be a practical technology that is widely used. Now, this is not the first effort to recognize the need and value of a new serial bus. There have been other efforts around. Um, and a lot of these efforts have been very well-intentioned. Some of the, many of them are well-designed. 
But I think none of them have the, the same design focus and meet the needs of the PC community, the PC environment, in the way that USB does. Apple's GeoPort is an outstanding solution for computer telephony integration if that's all you want to do with it. But that's really all it was designed to do. Apple has its own legacy. They have the Apple desktop bus, which does the other half of what USB does, connecting to all the peripheral devices. USB, as I see it, is really rolling together the functions of both of those interfaces into a single interface, so you've got one instead of two, and then bumping up the performance a bit, so there's actually some headroom to handle some future applications. Access Bus has been around for a while. It uh, has been adopted as a standard for a, for a CRT monitor control bus, um, but it's simply too slow. It, it, it's okay for a keyboard. It's a, probably okay for a mouse. There are things you could use it for, but if you're going to establish a new standard widely used in PCs, it just doesn't have the headroom that you want to see uh, in, in something that you're now going to start making a big investment in. And at the other end of the spectrum, there's 1394 Firewire, which is an outstanding interface, uh, runs at 100 megabits per second, and it's simply, you know, if, ac if access bus's problem is it's too slow, Firewire's problem is it's too fast. Um, that is, you simply don't need the performance of FireWire for the class of applications that USB is focused on, and running at that bit rate does carry some cost. The, uh, as we'll see in a minute, the interface complexity is greater. Um, there's more to worry about when you're running at those higher data rates. I think that FireWire and, or 1394 and USB are actually quite complementary, and I think that you will see uh, FireWire becoming a common PC connection at the point when people are commonly wanting to run high quality video in and out of PCs. Interesting thing is that this is an asymmetric design. If you look at Access Bus or GeoPort, the complexity of every node is the same whether it's at the, at the master end or the device end. Um, both 1394 and USB took an asymmetric approach which is designed to put as much of the complexity into the host as possible to keep the peripheral end as simple as possible. And note if you look at the host complexity, FireWire is modestly more complex than uh, USB, although it's, it, it's probably not a prohibitive difference, but if you look over at the peripheral interface, you can build a USB peripheral interface with far fewer gates than you can build a FireWire interface. And if you're building something like a mouse, that's a significant difference. Now, given the technology uh, motivation or the, you know, the, the, the technological opportunity that exists to create this standard, there remains a very nasty business problem, which is that the PC industry is so fragmented with really nobody having more than a 15% role as a systems vendor that it makes it very hard to set new standards. No single system vendor can lead a new standard into the PC market today, and we've, we've seen numerous examples of this. Yet to achieve its potential, USB has to be pervasive. If USB SB is only used in a couple of makers' machines, or there's only a couple of people making mice or keyboards, it simply will not come close to achieving the potential that it has to improve the PC industry. It is essential that this be widely used. So you could say, well, I could go to an official standards body, we can make it an IEEE standard and an ANSI standard and all that, but, but we want it this year. And um, you know, that process is an effective process in some way, but it is, it is simply too slow for the pace at which the PC industry moves. So USB follows a model which has an established success story, which is the PCI bus. It starts with a small group, but it's not a, not a arbitrary small group. It's a small group of very influential companies that also represent a diverse range of industries. You've got some chip makers, you've got some PC makers, you've got some people from the telecom industry, and they have to bring the specification to a certain point. Once you've brought it to that point, then you've got to broaden it out so that you can get input from people to refine what you've done and make sure that you have something that's really going to work. And we've, so we've seen both USB and PCI follow that model. Jim described how the Industry Association has now been launched and has gone from a half a dozen companies to now 150 companies. The USB spec is royalty free and openly available and this is a key issue in driving broad implementations. And this has been another problem with some other buses is that they have had proprietary uh, aspects of them that you had to go license and, and there were costs associated to it and it was just a restrictive sort of thing. Um, the fact that this is open, there are no uh, intellectual property concerns here, supports broad implementation. The Implementers Forum provides the mechanism that uh, allows people to coordinate 
uh, amongst themselves to make sure that you know if you have questions you can get them answered, that you can get support and so forth. Uh, and really what's going to drive implementations of USB is the volume of the PC industry. That if we can get just a modest part of the PC industry focused on USB, we're talking about tens of millions of units a year. So this, the, the, the huge volume of the PC industry uh, makes it relatively easy to, to really drive a lot of development work. What we saw with PCI is that PCI came on very quickly. And why did it come on very quickly? Because Intel was out there with good chipsets being produced in high volume, and they were a very aggressive motherboard maker. So it pushed the technology into the industry much more rapidly than it would have otherwise happened. You're going to see the same thing with USB. As Jim said, you're going to see USB on Intel motherboards. You're going to see USB in Intel chipsets. But it ensures that fairly quickly there's a base of platforms out there. So it's appealing to peripheral developers to make peripherals instead of them getting into a long wait and see mode. That really almost any kind of telecom interface you want to do fits nicely within USB. I mean, even if you can imagine some utopian world where we all have T1 lines at our home so that we can browse the web without uh, watching pictures get painted slowly. Uh, even T1 is only a megabit and a half a second fits comfortably within the USB bandwidth. Audio on USB is an interesting uh, shift in the way PCs and their peripherals are structured. USB can eliminate the need for analog audio interfaces on the PCs. It allows you to move the analog electronics out of the PC and into the speaker, either a, into the audio device, either a speaker or a microphone, and then just send digital data over USB. So this is a really interesting opportunity because it both lowers the cost of the PC because the PC no longer needs to worry about audio interfaces. It potentially increases the quality of the audio because there's plenty of bandwidth here for 16-bit uh, sampled, two-channel, 44.1 kilohertz sound that fits comfortably within the USB bandwidth, uh, along with lots of other things. And it's pure digital all the way out to the speaker, which means the speaker now has a, a, a completely contained environment for its analog electronics. And uh, I think that's a, a real sort of paradigm shift in the way analog electronics may be done with PCs. Speakers and microphones could be built into the monitor, where again, you'd, you'd have the analog electronics there in the monitor driving your, your speakers. You don't need a separate audio connection to the monitor in order to be able to provide audio in the monitor. And for monitor vendors, this offers them a, a, a range of differentiation opportunities far beyond anything they've had before. There's another class of peripheral that USB enables. I talked about low-cost user interface devices, but also low-cost telecom interfaces, um, ISDN interfaces, maybe even some video devices, where now as we have faster and faster central processors, where the host processor can do a lot of the processing for the interface. So you don't need a lot of computational power in the interface in many cases. You can reduce the interface to really being just I.O. pins with you know, whatever sort of codecs you need. Um, but then what you need is some cheap, fairly high bandwidth interface from your host system to that low-cost peripheral. And uh, USB is, is a natural fit there. So as you've heard, the, uh, the not quite 1.0 version of the specification is, is out. This, this is intended to allow active development to begin. Intel will be putting uh, USB interfaces into chipsets. And the, low, the microcontrollers will be there from Intel. Presumably, they'll be there from other companies as well. Uh, and really, you know, to, to really start taking off here, we need people to start building products with it. We need peripheral makers. We need the chip makers. Everyone needs to, to start building the products. And I think you know, next year is going to be the year that all of this really builds up. I think USB has an interesting role in actually broadening the PC market. It really is an important step towards moving PCs towards more appliance-like ease of use. It makes them closer to real consumer devices by having true plug-and-play operation, multiple devices on one interface, so you don't have to worry about how many USB slots you have. Uh, and you know, if you think about a potential future PC, if you have you know, your graphics and you know, your basic disk controller and so forth on the motherboard. Uh, and you've got maybe a card bus slot or two in case you want to add some high bandwidth peripherals. And you've got a USB connector for all of your slow speed peripherals. You now have a PC where you really don't need to be able to open the box, except maybe to add memory when the next version of Windows comes out or something. But, uh, <laughs> I think as this rolls out, um, you're going to see that the folks who are willing to be pioneers are going to have systems and devices early next year. And I think this is a decision that all of you need to make, which is 
Uh, do you want to be a pioneer and, and there is always the risk of having an arrow in your back? Uh, or, you, or do you want to wait? And you know, it, there is a reality that there are probably going to be minor changes to the specification, I would guess, after the very first round of devices is built and tested because things are going to be learned in the process of building and testing those devices. But if you wait until all the risks are passed, you are not going to be a leader in this market and other people are going to get the differentiation opportunities and the early market opportunities and may be able to establish new product categories. For you, there is an opportunity here, which is that early implementation of USB is a real differentiation opportunity. At the end of 1997, it is not going to be a differentiation opportunity. It's going to be a checklist item, and if you don't have it, you're dead. Finally, let me just conclude by saying that you know, for a long time, the PC architecture looked relatively static. And I think both PCI and USB show that the PC architecture is evolving. It is changing for the better. Uh, and that puts all of you in the PC business um, having to make a real choice here. You need to follow the changes or be left behind. Thank you.